This is a video that I've been wanting to record for a while and I haven't for numerous reasons. Aside from the usual, I hate cameras and I'm terrible in front of a camera and I was made for podcasts and radio. Aside from all of that, it's because this video is something that is very personal and is probably going to be the beginning of several videos that are going to be incredibly personal. But I feel it's very important to make them. I'm worried about my hair going on my mic, so I'm probably going to be doing that quite a lot and I apologise. Uh, I want to talk about being autistic. I was diagnosed six months ago at the age of 44. And the past six months have been the continued recovery from a breakdown and um, what I now understand to be also autistic burnout. And so in the past six months, it's been kind of working very hard on healing and recovering from that, but also understanding and coming to terms with this diagnosis. And it's really hard. Just in case I do get to the point where I feel brave enough to release this on YouTube, I feel I should probably like explain who I am. Very potted summary. I'm an author um, and I've had 10 books published now, short stories. Uh, I used to be a podcaster. I won a Hugo Award for that. Uh, my most recent book series, the Planetfall series, science fiction, was also nominated for a Hugo Award. Um, and I dabble in painting and all sorts of things, but predominantly I'm a writer and I'm also an audiobook narrator. And some years ago, when I got my publishing deal and I started to exist in the world differently, as in I had books out there and people wanted to know who I was and find out more about me, I made a decision to be open about the fact that I suffer from mental illness. And at the time, I <laughs> believed because I had been diagnosed as suffering from generalised anxiety disorder. I received that diagnosis in my early 20s when I was at university. And for 20 odd years, I lived and managed my own mental health, believing that that was the cause of my problems, my struggles. And the reason why I decided to be very open about it was because it's very, very hard to have any kind of mental illness, but it's even harder when you think you're alone. And in recent years, just in the last 10 years, there has been such a change a very positive change um, in that people are being far more open about having mental illness and there's a lot more discussion um, and a lot more uh, conversation about it, which is great. I know I helped people by being open and I know I've helped people by writing books in which the protagonists have mental illnesses too. And I know that because people have written to me or have come and spoken to me at events to tell me about how either my book or what I've been talking about online has prompted them to get help. And, and it is, and that means the world to me. And that's why I'm here now very awkwardly and quite badly, my apologies, talking to camera about this because 
that decision still stands. I still think it's important to be open about the struggles we have if we are able to do it and if we are in a safe place to do so. I am not going to make anyone feel guilty for not talking about this stuff openly. But I am in a position where I can talk about this. It's not easy, but I can do it and so I will. So after 10 years or so of being an author, being open about the fact that I have an anxiety disorder, kaboom, suddenly, no, that's a misdiagnosis. I don't have that. I'm autistic. This is very common for women, apparently, who are in their 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, older, um, who have struggled all their lives and um, are told that they have an anxiety disorder or depression and anxiety, which I had at various points, um, or bipolar disorder is also very common, apparently. And I can really understand why, <laughs> but maybe that's for another video. So, first of all, I wanted to say hello. At the age of 44, I discovered that I am autistic, that I am also dyspraxic, um, and that I probably also have ADHD. Um, and the reason I say probably is because my psychologist identified significant ADHD traits and pointed them out and also put me through the first round of um, questionnaires, exploratory questionnaires in which I scored very, very highly for ADHD. Um, but my assessment was only for um, autism, for the autistic spectrum. Um, and I would have had to pay for another round um, of assessments, which I, I, I can't afford. Um, but with the amount of stuff that I've been reading and learning lately about ADHD as well as the autistic spectrum, I think she's right. I think I do <laughs> do show a lot, a lot of characteristics of ADHD. So, uh, yeah, I'm. Hello, I am being alive as an older woman who has only just been been diagnosed. If you are in a similar situation or if you're an older woman who is thinking. I've heard this from a friend. I'm very similar to my friend. Maybe I'm autistic too. Should I go for this? Is possible? Blah, 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 blah. Hi. I thought it might be helpful to talk about the process uh, that I went through to get a diagnosis. Uh, and as much as I adore the NHS, and absolutely passionately defend it at every opportunity. I had a very bad experience in terms of assessment for, uh, for autism through the NHS. So I'm gonna be very open about that. Um, I keep pausing because this is really hard. <laughs> this is really hard. Why is this hard? It's so personal. So uh, I don't know, about three years ago now, um, time is meaningless. Pandemic and also my brain does not do time very well. Uh, I think three, nearly four years ago now, I don't know. I spent a weekend with my two best friends and I started to uh, open up to them about how hard I was finding various things at the time. And after a very, very long and difficult conversation and the way that I reacted to that conversation and, um, and because of me being who I am and them both being really quite knowledgeable, um, they basically said, have you ever considered that you might be autistic? 
and I was like, no, <laughs> that's ridiculous. And why did I think it was ridiculous? Because I am not the same as the dominant stereotypical presentation of autistic people. And I say people when in fact, it's usually men or boys uh, that we experience through pop culture and the media. I'm thinking of Rain Man being one of the most popular films in its day and the portrayal of a character in that. I'm thinking about, um, oh, The Dog in the Nighttime book. I can't remember the exact full title, which I loved when I read it many, many, many years ago. I'm, I can think of various um, TV shows that are really quite recent where I think one of the main characters is an autistic boy who wears headphones all the time. The important point is, is that when, <laughs> when they suggested it and I applied that version of what autism is to myself, there was an immediate error match returned. That wasn't me. I'm not like that. I am. But it's complicated. I did some research. And with the help of my friends, I made a long list of things that are symptoms. Is that the right word? Behavior, behaviors, uh, problems, um, that are all associated with um, autism. And I gave it to my GP and said, I've been advised that I should pursue a diagnosis. Um, and I said to the GP, could you have a look at them? And if you agree, then could you advise on what to do next? So, um, a week or so later, I went back and uh, he said, I have no doubt that you should have an assessment. I've read through your notes and I am not an expert, but from what I know of autism, uh, you really do seem to have a lot of those characteristics. Um, and the other thing I did was something called the AQ50, I think it's called, um, which is um, a standardized questionnaire that is um, supposed to um, identify whether it's likely that you have autism and uh, out of a score of 50 I think I scored 39 and I think it's something like over 35 there's a possibility you may be autistic. I can't remember the numbers very well. Go in and Google it if, uh, if you're curious about that. Um, and uh, so he put me into the system and a few months later I had an interview booked. Um, and it was a really embarrassing and belittling experience. Um, I went there, I was interviewed um, by a man who, his title was um, nurse, um, but it was in a specialist unit, I think, um, that specialised in, um, in autism. And he interviewed me for an hour and a half, and it really did not feel like a very in-depth interview. An hour and a half sounds like a long time, but yeah. <laughs> Anyway, at the end of the interview, he told me um, that he did not think that I was autistic. And the reasons he gave were the fact that I'm an author is one of them. Um, I'm an author and he's read, he'd read um, stories written by autistic girls. I don't know if he'd also 
read anything written by autistic women, but certainly girls, he was talking about um, in their teens where there's a huge amount of world building and very little um, character and character development and interpersonal relationships. Um, and he said that I had had a very obviously successful career as a writer and therefore I, that doesn't fit the profile. Um, he enjoyed the conversation with me. That was another reason why I was not autistic in his opinion. Um, he asked me about science fiction as part of the interview and we discussed it quite animatedly um, for about, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes, I think. Um, and he said that I was such a warm and engaging speaker about the subject of science fiction that I couldn't possibly be autistic. Even though in the interview I had talked about how I had had to learn how to do that as part of my job, that I had spent a huge amount of time and effort analysing what makes somebody an interesting and engaging speaker and anyway, <laughs> yeah, he said that because he enjoyed that conversation I couldn't possibly be autistic because when he speaks to autistic people about their special interests um, they are not warm and interesting and engaging. They will be overly pedantic, um, that they will just list things that they know about it. They will correct errors. And from what he was talking about, that fit more the kind of stereotypical media portrayal of autism. And I don't fit that. So he was like, no, you can't possibly be autistic. He said, oh, yes, it, you know, you do obviously have problems um, with eye contact. Um, but I think you have CPTSD. I don't think that you're autistic. Now, spoiler, <laughs> I have got CPTSD. Um, I got a therapist last year. Uh, when I um, was having a breakdown um, and he diagnosed it. So to this man's credit, yes, he identified I have CPTSD. He ignored all of the sensory processing issues I described in the interview. He ignored um, my descriptions of having um, shutdowns. Um, he ignored um, the fact that I explained that I find friendship incredibly difficult and that I cannot think of a single enduring friendship in my life that does not revolve around my special interest, which is role playing, um, one of my many special interests, um, that I don't know how to make friends with people if there is not a common passionate interest in something that I am passionately interested in. I don't know how to do that. But because I have friends, he said I couldn't be autistic. And that was that. And I left that room feeling like a complete idiot. I thought, oh, <laughs> of course I'm not, of course I'm not autistic. I have generalised anxiety disorder and potentially CPTSD now. Breakdown happens about two, two years, a year after this, I can't remember. Like I said, time is meaningless. Uh, and I got a therapist who was fantastic and, um, and throughout therapy, weekly therapy, he picked up on things, picked up on the way that I talk about my life, about my brain, um, about my reactions to things. And he started to say, are you sure 
are you sure you're not autistic? <laughs> I think you probably phrased it much better than that. Or, you know, have you considered that you may be autistic? And I told him and said, no, I went through this process. And he just smiled and said, I have several older female clients who have had exactly the same experience in the NHS. And then when they've had a proper assessment, they have been found to be autistic. I strongly urge you to get a second opinion. And I was, I fought against it for a while. I mean, money was a big factor. It's not cheap. It was nearly, it was over 800 pounds. Makes me feel sick when I think about the amount of money it cost. But I needed to understand and also it was clear from my breakdown, from the huge impact it was having on my livelihood and my ability to write, but also cope with public appearances that I needed to know, because if I could find out, then I could ask for accommodations. Now, I don't, I needed that. I needed that piece of paper. I needed that diagnosis because I'm very bad at st standing up for myself and my needs. I'm not saying that you can't ask for those accommodations if you haven't had a formal diagnosis. There is, there is such a complex interaction between capitalism, privilege and patriarchy and misogyny involved in getting a diagnosis as an older woman that I, I really do advocate for self-diagnosis because I took a big financial hit getting this diagnosis and not everybody can do that. So I found a psychologist who specialises in the assessment and diagnosis of autism, in particular in adults, and had a lot of experience in the diagnosis of older women. And she was fantastic. It started with several questionnaires, not just the AQ50. There was a questionnaire for um, a family member as well to get information about childhood and my dad helped me fill that out. <laughs> I laugh because it actually uncovered some stuff um, which is more to do with my dad than myself so I'm not going to talk about it here in case this does end up on YouTube one day but yeah it was a very interesting process. Um, and then it was during the pandemic so it was done over a um, Zoom call um, and it was a seven hour assessment split into two 3.5 hour sessions. And it was utterly exhausting and grueling. And she went through every single detail in the questionnaires. I don't know if you've done any questionnaires ever, <laughs> but questionnaires infuriate me. They are such a blunt tool. They are so frustrating that the thing that was great about her was that she would take one of my responses and say, explain this, give me an example. Why did you say this? And then I could explain the nuances that the questionnaire couldn't convey. The thing that came, came, came up again and again and again and again in the assessment is was something like, do you have problems with this particular aspect of human behaviour? And my usual response was, now not so much, but that's because I have developed this complex strategy to deal with it. This is how I deal with it. Oh, I didn't know how to do that as a child. Yes, here are several examples of when I didn't have that strategy, my life was so much harder and horrible. And that just kept coming up again and again and again and again. And the assessment really brought home to me how much work goes into functioning as a normal adult. 
in 21st century England. For me, that is. At the end of the seven hours of assessment, she gave me a verbal response immediately and she said, yes, it is absolutely clear to me that you are autistic. Um, you have an atypical presentation in some respects. You are very unusually highly creative and that is not something which is common, um, but it is present. Hello, I exist, therefore it must be, be a real thing. Um, and because I am very academically gifted and <laughs> have a very distinct profile of CPTSD and uh, trauma responses, this wasn't picked up on at school because I worked incredibly hard to be perfect and normal. I was shit at it, you have to understand. But I was good enough to not flag up to the teachers that there was something wrong. I just went through a living hell that was school. <sighs> and she said, yeah, you, you are autistic. I strongly believe that you um, also have ADHD, but I would have to do a detailed assessment to be confident in that. Um, uh, yes. There is evidence of CPTSD as well. Um, the per surprise, surprise, there are not many people who are autistic who are not traumatized by existing in the world because the world is not geared up for people like us. She explained that the breakdown, a huge part of that was autistic burnout. <sighs> And so that was uh, the end of October last year. Uh, but that was my experience of having an assessment. Now, the NHS experience I had is apparently very common, especially for older women. So if you, obviously I urge you to go through the NHS first, because it might be that you have a really good experience and there are places where they are really, really on the ball and much better at diagnosing um, women. I guess what I want to say is the assessment process can be very, very difficult. If you have a long list of symptoms, behaviours, characteristics, sensitivities, difficulties that seem to match the autistic spectrum, but a very surface level NHS interview says, no, you're not. Maybe get a second opinion because I'm proof that, that it's not always going to give you the best experience and that the second opinion is what you need. And I really don't think I really don't think without the depth of the assessment I had that it could have been picked up. I'm going to stop this video now. I'm going on too much. I think I am processing as I'm talking and that's not necessarily good for a video. I don't want you to suffer. I don't want you to feel like you're alone. So if you're going through this process, I, I'm six months in the future to where you are, potentially, if you get your diagnosis. And if you've just had it, hi, it's hard, isn't it? And if you're thinking about going through this process, it's worth it. It's worth it to understand your brain. Okay, I'm going to stop there.